Hello friends, can I bid you a warm welcome to our service of the word at home on this, the third Sunday of Easter. And it's good to share with you in worship this morning from my home, the rectory in Bulwell, to your home, wherever you are today. I do hope that you're keeping safe and well. And if you have a candle to hand, I'm going to light this candle here at the rectory as we begin our worship this morning as a sign of Jesus, the light of the world, coming into the world afresh and filling it with nothing but his light and his love and cancelling out any darkness that we may be feeling at this time. And as I said, you might like to light a candle wherever you are as a sign of Jesus' warmth and light, filling your hearts, filling your spirits and filling the world with light. Let's take up our service orders. Friends, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The opening responses. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Saint Paul wrote, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. An opening prayer. God our Father, we give thanks that you raised your Son from death to life and exalted him to your right hand in glory. Send the Holy Spirit that we may worship you our Father, and serve him, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, we have gathered to worship God, conscious of our unworthiness to do so. Using the words of Saint Augustine, we pray. Lord Jesus, our Saviour, let us come near. Our hearts are cold. Lord, have mercy. Warm them with your selfless love. Our hearts are sinful. Christ, have mercy. Cleanse them with your precious blood. Our hearts are weak. Lord, have mercy. Strengthen them with your joyous spirit. Our hearts are empty. Christ, have mercy. Fill them with your divine presence. Lord Jesus, our hearts are yours. Possess them always and only for yourself. Amen. And so may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And like St Augustine, we too can be sure of God's eternal and everlasting love for us. And so we say the Gloria together, joining in with Christians throughout the ages. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you and give you thanks 
we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. A collect for the day. In the stillness of our homes, let us pray. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth. Through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So the scripture readings for this third Sunday of Easter. In our Old Testament reading is taken from Genesis chapter 7, beginning to read at verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the air also, male and female, to keep their kind alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. The rain fell on the earth for forty days and forty nights, on the very same day, Noah with his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons, entered the ark. They and every wild animal of every kind, and all domestic animals of every kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every bird of every kind, every bird, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God has commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued for forty days on the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters swelled and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. Our second reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 14. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the people. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made by him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. 
So those who welcomed his message were baptised, and that day about 3,000 persons were added to their number. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So hear now the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now reading is from Luke chapter 24, beginning to read at verse 13. Now on that same day, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. Jesus said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered Jesus, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and and our how chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, But they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And so, friends, let us pray. Heavenly Father, fill my mouth with all good stuff and shut it when I've said enough. Amen. Friends, let me tell you about a lovely couple called Maud and Harry. Now, Maud and Harry had been happily married for six years. It by no means was bliss all the time, but they'd become the best of friends in their struggle to live a genuine life together with their two children. One evening, Harry is having a drink with his old friend, John who was the best man at the wedding. As they exchange notes on married life, 
Harry told John how he has loved Maud from the first moment he set eyes on her. John, however, contradicts Harry. He says, Harry, old son, you've forgotten that I introduced you to Maud. Remember? You heard her talking at a party I was giving. And when you heard her rabbiting on, you said that whoever married her would be marrying a mobile Oxford English dictionary. I wonder who was right in their recollections, Harry or John? John remembered the event as it was then, but Harry remembered it as something more, an event that led to where he is now. Because Harry is in love now. He takes that love back in time and invests the past with a new significance. His relationship with Maud now affects the way he remembers their beginnings. He gives their first meeting a significance it never actually had at the time because he reads it in the light of his present love. His love actually changes the past. Friends, like Harry, because we change, we review our past differently. We keep reinterpreting the past in the light of what is going on now in our lives. What appeared to be a mountain at the time often turns out to be a molehill in retrospect. What appeared to be a chance encounter can become the most important meeting of our lives. Often the meaning of an experience is unclear at the time we have the experience. We have to wait for the meaning. Only then, when we look back, can we fully understand. In our Gospel reading today, two disciples are struggling to make sense of a recent event, the death of Jesus. They leave Jerusalem over their shoulders as the place where their hopes met with a sense of final defeat. When a stranger joins them on the road to Emmaus, they tell the story of their disappointment. Jesus, the one they had hoped would set Israel free, is now dead. And in their story, it becomes clear that they cannot hold two things together, their hope in Jesus and his death. The death of Jesus cancels out their hope and they feel hopeless and helpless. The two disciples cannot understand how the death of Jesus can be understood as anything more than a tragic end to a life of promise. Like most people they believe that if you haven't actually achieved what you set out to do before your death you'll never achieve it in death itself. When you're dead, it's too late for everything. Death is the end of the road of promise. So the disciples mourn not only the death of Jesus, but the death of their relationship with him. Now they are the ex-disciples of a dead prophet. They have faces that match their story. Only when they've finish their own story, does the stranger begin to tell his story? The stranger invites the disciples to look at the past again, this time in the light of scripture. He gives a wholly different interpretation of the same event as he sees the death of Christ as something which was essential for his glory. According to the stranger, the death of Jesus was the achievement of his mission, not the collapse of it. As the stranger helps the two disciples to make sense of the past in a new light, they respond by inviting him to stay with them. When they go into table, they break bread together, and the stranger gives himself away by giving himself away to them. He is the risen Jesus, and he leaves them with hearts that burn and with eyes that see. 
Not only does he help the disciples to interpret the past in their new experience of him as the risen Lord, he also gives them a new future. They can now face Jerusalem even in the darkness and they return there to share their story with the others. In their new experience of Jesus as the risen Lord, the disciples' past is changed. They can now revisit the past with the new light and the new love that they have experienced. They take the light of Easter Sunday back into the darkness of Good Friday and everything looks different now. Only the risen Jesus makes sense of everything that went before. In his word and in the breaking of the bread, the past is brought up to date. The past is now interpreted in the light of the great truth that Jesus is risen and that Jesus is the Lord. Friends, when we gather each week to worship, wherever that might be, Jesus comes among us not as the stranger, rather he comes to us in word and sacrament when we're able to take it, to give us new hope to face the future with him in faith. Our own stories may not sound very different from the two forlorn disciples on the road to Emmaus. We too, especially in these times of lockdown, may be covered in disappointment and disillusionment. We too may have a past that makes little sense to us, but we are invited to tell our stories to the Lord, to listen to him as he speaks his word and to recognise him in the breaking of bread. Only then can we look with understanding at the past and look with hope to the future. In Jesus' name, Amen. And so as we turn back to our orders of service, let us proclaim our faith in God. And as ever, do join in with me in the words in bold print. Friends, do we believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do we believe and trust in God, the Son who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do we believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world. We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of our church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so believing and trusting in this God, who has been with us in the past, is with us now and will be with us for all time. Let us make our prayers to him as we come to our time of intercessions. Our loving Father in heaven, as we recall the change that came over the disciples when they met the risen Christ on that first Easter day, we pray for the renewal of faith, hope and love among us, your people, today. We pray for our fellow human beings living in fear of persecution and violence. Strengthen their hope that peace and justice will prevail. In these difficult times, throughout the world. Guide our Queen and all the leaders of all the nations. Lord, renew our hope in your victory over evil. 
We pray for those who, like the Apostle Thomas, struggle with doubts and hard questions. Make yourself known to them through the good news that Christ is alive and through the witness of us, his followers. Lord, renew us by your Spirit. Pray for those who, like the disciples in our reading today, are burdened by feelings of guilt, failure or grief. Give them a fresh awareness of Christ's love and forgiveness. Lord, renew our joy in your amazing grace. Pray for all who are sent into the world to bear witness to Christ for our bishops, ministers and missionaries. Lead them and us by your Holy Spirit into new ways of serving you. Lord, renew our commitment to your service. In a moment of quiet, we pray for those whom we know are ill or frail. for those who are especially suffering with the coronavirus at this time. Lord, we ask that you would grant healing and encouragement to all those whom we ask of you today. Lord, renew our trust in your fatherly care. We remember all those who have died. In a moment of stillness we lift before you, O Lord, those whom we love but for a little while see no longer. And we join with all Christians in lifting our voices to proclaim the living Christ as our Lord and our God. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Friends, the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord lift his countenance upon us and give us peace. And so in our hearts and homes, we pray for the love of God the Father. In our living and caring, we pray for the grace of God the Son. In our coming and going, we pray for the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, it has been wonderful to share with you in worship now. And as we conclude our service, I wish you a continuing sense of happiness, a continuing living out of healthiness, and above all, a sense of God's holiness. Until we meet again. Amen.